All right, thank you. Good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lata Poonamali. I'm the Chair of Management uh, Faculty at the New School and the host of this event. And uh, I'm beyond thrilled to invite all of you back to the launch of the second Management and Social Justice Conversation Series. As many of you repeat attendees know, the first series emerged as a result of a pivot because of the pandemic. Uh, so what was to be a two-day conference became a year-long series with participation from all over the world. But the online format yielded some unexpected positive results, which is that it made the series accessible and affordable to everybody. And so we decided to retain that. And because of the enthusiasm and engagement in the series, we are doing it the second year. And today is the uh, launch of the second series. As my dear colleague at the New School, Professor Nidhi Srinivas always likes to say, injustice happens within organizations. And I always counter uh, saying that, that justice also must be enacted within organizations. Everything we do as a human collective is done in some form of organization, whether it's a church, whether it's a football team, whether it's a private sector, government, co-ops, any structure, nonprofits, uh, but all of our work is done within organizations. Therefore, learning how and teaching how to remake organizations as sites of justice, inclusion and equity, and how to harness management theory and practice for collective well-being is an essential question and one that we explore through the series and one that we engage at the new school management programs. And so in this series, we also lift up academics and practitioners and activists who are on the ground, inventing new models, trying new tactics and creating new kinds of organizations and leadership models. So people say charity has to begin at home. In conversations about justice and equity, I think honest reflection also has to begin at home. So I'm really delighted that we are beginning this series by looking at academic institutions and higher ed institutions as sites of social justice, and especially as organizations where people come together to do their work and where there are managerial dynamics and challenges in making change happen. And we have an extremely dynamic panel uh, who will introduce themselves uh, shortly. And I'm looking forward to conversation with them and hearing from them from different uh, academic institutions. But equally importantly, I am really delighted that we have our president, Wright McBride, with us to deliver the opening remarks for today's session. And we also have our new provost, uh, Renee White, joining us in the panel. And interestingly, when I invited Renee, uh, to be part of the panel last year. Uh, she was in a previous institution. I had happened to meet her earlier and I've always admired Renee's work. And so I wanted her to be part of this panel. So I'm really delighted that now she's actually on the panel as a new school person. So welcome everybody. And I want to invite President McBride to deliver his remarks. Thank you, President McBride for uh, making time for this. Thank you so much, Latha. Um, and hello and welcome to everyone uh, on the program today. I'm really pleased to be here and to celebrate and to congratulate and to really thank Professor Punamali and her colleagues for organizing this important series and this particular program. Let me begin by acknowledging the contributions also of Christina Pizzuli, uh, the team of students who have worked on this effort, and of course, Executive Dean Mary Watson whose work and support and enthusiasm has been critical to making this program possible today. I am particularly pleased that today's program turns the lens on higher education and examines the ways in which our institutions are building capacity for more socially just organizational cultures and practices. This is exactly the kind of dialogue that we should be having here at the new school. And quite honestly, it's exactly the kind of dialogue, to put a fine point on it, that I think only we at the New School can have. We are the university where considerations of management go well beyond the well-worn pedagogical assumptions and approaches of traditional business schools. And we are the university that wants to ensure that the future of management and business education is really shaped by the values of equity, inclusion, and social justice. This series of programming is one way that we continually develop that distinctive approach. And it is how we are building a community of management scholars, students, and practitioners who are actively thinking and leading 
this work. It's really a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm delighted to turn the program back over to Professor Punamali to get this conversation started. Um, I am delighted to hear from this exciting panel, which of course includes my new colleague uh, and partner, uh, Renee White, uh, our new provost. Delighted and thrilled to be here and very much looking forward to this important conversation. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, thank you, uh, President McBride, and uh, welcome panel again. Uh, our moderator, Anita Howard, um, has some technological issues in logging in, so I'm going to be stepping in for her for um, this moment until she can come in. So we're going to start uh, with actually asking the panel uh, to introduce uh, themselves. Uh, by giving a personal narrative in terms of like, you know, how did you land on this and uh, uh, where did you come from uh, in terms of your personal story and uh, basically your higher ed background and role and what is your approach for moving within and uh, in the beyond the academic space and thoughts on major challenges. So, uh, you know, what is your approach to moving change and influence and power? So, and I'm going to just use my, um, gallery view to invite people. But before that, I already have an agreement with uh, our provost, Renee. And I said, this is the first time you have, I've caught you in public. And so I would like to invite Renee to start self-introduction. And then I'm going to use my panel to uh, invite everybody as in the order that I see on my screen. So thank you, Renee, over to you. All right, thank you so much. Um, it, it is a, a pleasure to be here. And, you know, um, as President McBride uh, said as well, um, you know, to be at an institution where these particular kinds of questions are, you know, sort of part and parcel of how we operate and how we function, I think is an important value that I want to um, acknowledge and call out. So a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a, a sociologist um, by training and um, in my own sort of academic work have always explored um, questions of um, identity around race and ethnicity, social class, gender, um, and sort of how they intersect and how systems either constrain or open opportunity. And uh, some of my work has been around uh, sort of health and health policy. Some of it has been race theory and other elements are looking at representations in popular culture. And I, I present myself and I define myself um, as a Black feminist scholar. I am, um, you know, a cis woman um, and I recognize the privilege that comes from that position. And at the same time, recognize that my experience as a Black woman in America is very particular and is shaped by what that means in our nation. So for me, you know, my work uh, has to be grounded in principles of equity, justice, access um, from a Black feminist perspective. And I think a lot about what does it mean to move from theory to operationalizing that? What does it mean to move from theory to praxis? And you know, how might I engage in that work, um, both from when I was a faculty member in my classes and also in my work now um, in administrative and sort of academic leadership roles. And you know, one of the challenges that I think um, I, have, I have observed has come from being at very different kinds of institutions. So I actually have benefited from being as a faculty member at a land grant institution, at a public university, at a private institution, and then moved into academic leadership roles um, at a women-centered university, a liberal arts college, and now here um, at the New School. And so all of that really informs the way I try to think about, um, you know, who are our students? What is, it, what is the experience of being in higher ed for our students? What is the experience of being in higher ed systems for staff and faculty? How do we operate as institutions in relation to community? What does it mean to um, think of ourselves as institutions as being an actor, right? And being a civic actor. Um, and how do we utilize these sort of core values that we're talking about today to inform the ways that we move forward? 
So I just want to talk a little bit um, about um, how I, I'm approaching some of these these guiding questions. So you know, as I was thinking about you know how do, how do we move within and beyond academic spaces, my first question was what what do we mean by academic spaces? What are the boundaries that define academic from non-academic? And you know, even that framing, which I think is an important one, but does also beg the question of um, how we perceive of um, what it means to be an academic, what it means to be um, an institution of higher ed, and, and who is the in-group and who is sort of excluded from that sort of, uh, that kind of boundary. Um, but beyond that, you know, I do think a lot about, you know, how does academia as a system and network and set of relationships and organizations constrain or inhibit equity and justice? And that's from how we define our disciplines, right? Um, it's from uh, what kinds of institutions where we get training are considered to be legitimate and which ones are called into question. It's about how we structure our tenure and promotion processes to, uh, to sort of question certain types of scholarship that actually are about the very principles that we espouse. So when we question community engaged scholarship or when we ask whether um, work that is not peer reviewed is legitimate and authentic, we are reinforcing systems of exclusion that are absolutely counter to what we, uh, we embrace. So I think that you know, one of the things that we need to do is think about how the, the ways that we value and validate intellectual work, creative work, and who are part of our communities actually is reproducing all of the same things that we are also you know, really claiming to um, challenge and push up against. And I think that we have a lot, a lot that we can learn from the questions that community organizations and community leaders are asking, you know, and I think that um, there, there's a lot to learn from the past two years of, of activism around, you know, racial ec equity, climate justice, um, reproductive rights, and sort of what can we take from the kinds of um, strategies and leadership and policy uh, inquiries that come out of those movements, and what might that tell us about the way we need to be operating as um, our own institutions. And so um, a couple of things that I, I wanted to kind of throw out there, and then I'm really happy to hear from the rest of the panel, and I'm happy to, you know, to pursue any of the points that I'm, I'm raising, because I'm known to ask a lot of questions and then sort of see where we go with the answers, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot is, is, is facing a rate, a Reckoning, right? So we've talked about this particularly as a moment of a racial reckoning. And that I, I find that both inviting and actually a little annoying because, you know, who's being reckoned to do what? <laughs> and now's the reckoning, like where have we been the past 400 years? So this is like not a new thing, but I think that when institutions say we're at a moment of reckoning, we need to really acknowledge the fact that maybe we haven't been paying attention to the indicators and the symptoms that have been very clear about um, the, the sort of uh, racial and gender and class and religion and um, sort of international fissures that have already been there. Um, not that we shouldn't say it, but that we should be clear that we're just now recognizing the reckoning, but it's been there all along. Um, I think that a lot of institutions that are, are calling to themselves to account around these reckonings often aren't really prepared for what the work requires and that the work requires more than the task forces and the committees, but it really is about a really fulsome examination of um, how we're structured, what is our history, how do we operate, and where are we situated in relationship to the communities that we have an impact on. You know, which means that you know we have to be prepared for the pushback. We have to be prepared for the 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 claims that our work is elitist. That you know that there are questioning our systems of power and, and equity is a reflection of being in the ivy tower, and that you know the average person you know doesn't respond to that. And we know that's not true. We have to be prepared for the risk taking that this requires. That you know there may be donors, there may be people attached to our institutions. We're not going to like the work that we do, which doesn't make it any less necessary to do it, but we have to be prepared institutionally and in terms of leadership to sort of manage the sort of um, fallout from, from some of the choices that we might want to make. We have to recognize that systems are slow to change, but that, that means that the work is important and maybe we need to uh, sort of decode why systemic obstruction slows things down and move and change the systems, um, which is what our students tell us all the time. They're impatient. 
they are asking us to move quicker than we're ready to move because they see how slow things can be. And it's really for those of us in leadership roles, um, which I define more than just titles, right? Um, I think that the, what does it mean to affect change and to push those systems is important. And then lastly, I will say um, that uh, I've been thinking about this in, in terms of you know, what I wanna do in my role. And I'm sort of defining it around four things, audit, acknowledgement, accountability, and action. Audit what's going on, right? Figure out um, all the big questions that you need to ask within our institutions, you know, at a broader level, thinking about the big questions we should be asking in higher ed. Um, acknowledge what's working and what isn't, which makes you accountable and it requires you to act and then do it again, right? So I'm trying to think about in my role from a black feminist vantage point, what does it mean to do that work and how do I partner with people in other institutions to make sure that we are actually moving, moving forward and um, rattling the cages a bit more than I think we've been able to thus far. Okay. Thank you, Lene. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I really, uh, obviously, you're stepping into a role uh, at a time uh, where it's uh, very complex. Uh, it, it, like I know the first two weeks, what you've been handling in terms of just the re-entry post-COVID or in the middle of COVID, uh, according to some statistics, uh, is, uh, is not an easy um, time to enter. And I think it's the same thing with President McBride. Like, you know, he took office um, and like we were talking earlier that 18 months, this is the first time he's been actually on campus and meeting people in person. So uh, it's such a you know, dramatic moment, even if the moment of reckoning is a little bit offensive uh, while it's been long coming, but it's definitely a dramatic moment at this point uh, for higher ed institutions. And, and the other piece that you know, I, I really do appreciate is your mentioning about the in-group versus out-group and the, uh, you know, the nature of the elitist nature of most academic institutions that separate uh, people, right? And I think it's a very important thing to remember. And, and I think also the higher ed institutions get complex in, in another very interesting way that I would like at a later point of time or some of the panelists to address is that, when you think about representation in higher ed, especially in the in the US or in most Western schools now, uh, you have a lot of international students who are immigrants. And, uh, you know, uh, do we think about representation from that perspective also? Does our, uh, you, you know, diversity and inclusion uh, equity initiatives, so do organizations look at ourselves as US institutions? Are, are we looking at as a totally global institutions? Because if we are not, then we are participating in the same colonizing um, impetus that other imperialist um, initiatives have had. And, and so, you know, it makes it even more complex and more nuanced. And so it's a very interesting uh, introduction. I'm really looking forward to obviously chatting more with you, uh, you know, as time goes. So I'm going to, uh, invite uh, Jay Gooseby, uh, who is from Pepperdine University, and she's actually taught for the new school in the past. Uh, I think now it's probably she's too busy to come and teach for us. <laughs> Way to put that out there, Lada. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yes, I have. Uh, my name is Jay Gooseby Smith, and um, I guess a narrative uh, introduction summary would be that I bring what comes from computer science, business, organizational behavior, and theology to bear on looking at um, issues of diversity, equity, um, inclusion, and justice. Um, originally from Gary, Indiana, which is predominantly a city full of people who are like me, uh, northern born descendants of those who left the South. Then I went to Spelman College and uh, majored in computer science and then took an internship and moved to New Hampshire and worked in Massachusetts. And it was in that transition that the people became far more interesting than the computers. And uh, so long story short, um, I actually met Anita and Lata after a career in corporate IT uh, at Case Western Reserve University. 
where I earned my uh, MBA and PhD in organizational behavior. And I share all that to say, um, because one of the things that Dr. White was talking about was how being at different types of institutions really helps you to have a good view of, of higher education. I would also add to that, having um, been socialized in different academic disciplines does the same because it helps you to look at these topics um, at different levels of analysis and it helps you look at them um, through different lenses. As far as past academic experience, um, I am at Pepperdine University currently. I started my career at Pepperdine University 20, 21 years ago. However, I also had the experience of teaching at Butler University uh, Pepperdine University is a Christian university on the West Coast in Malibu, California. I've taught at Butler University, which is a Midwestern private uh, institution in my home state of Indiana. I've taught at California State University, Channel Islands, which is a public university in California. And uh, most recently, I taught at the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina, which is um, a public university, and it's in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. And um, I was tenured or tenure track at multiple different schools. And one of the interesting um, things that that has brought me with looking at diversity in higher education is the importance of, um, of representation. And the representation um, isn't just for its own sake. And so many times I think we make mistakes in organizations because we don't make explicit why that representation is important. Um, it's important because students many times are looking for people quote, like them to help motivate them to see that they can get from one stage to the next. Also, um, the representation matters from the standpoint of how we view knowledge, you know, and how we enter space. For example, um, one of the educational degrees that I'm about to finish currently is a Master of Divinity. And I looked long and hard and I decided to complete that last degree ever to be earned with my name on it um, at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, which is an HBCU, but it's comprised of multiple denominations. And I chose that because again, I like the difference uh, of opinions and perspective that things bring and so when I look at um, higher education and, um, and so currently right now I'm serving as vice president for community belonging and chief diversity officer at Pepperdine University. So this is the inaugural um, of that position. It's not been held before. So I have the joy of creating a new department with a new team and doing this work in a Christian environment. And so that has been um, extremely gratifying because one of the things I think we all often don't have when doing this work is the why. And so, like I was saying earlier, we have these programs, we say representation matters, we say we need to teach students about this, but the why is very hard to convey. And so where I am now, I have the freedom of bringing the why that is consistent with the mission of the university to doing this work and many people will look at in a faith-based organization, they'll see faith-based on one side and they'll see diversity, equity, and inclusion on the other side and they'll actually pull them as opposites. And so I have both the fun and the gift and the blessing and the challenge of bringing those um, things together. Um, as far as moving within and beyond the academic space, um, I found that iron sharpens iron with both my technical career and my academic career. I started off as an individual contributor and then moved to going outside of the organization to actually do things with the skills that I had. So in IT, worked on being an internal consultant, then going out and doing training for corporations and then coming back in. The same thing with higher ed, with starting as a faculty member for several years and then gradually moving into more outward facing um, board memberships and also consulting roles. And I really think that is very important for looking at higher education and how we're gonna need to move into the future. Like you say, it's been an elitist organization and it's just kind of been the same old books, the same old authors, the same old topics taught in the same old way from the same old vantage point. And as we diversify um, faculty members, we're able to 
become more global, to have people who have heard of other philosophers from other continents. Um, one of the things that I, I do find to be true is that there's nothing new under the sun. And so if there's a philosopher that's one of the classics that we were taught that has said it, there's probably someone in South America or Africa or Asia or the Middle East who said it first. And so I think it's very important as we bring a diversity of views, a diversity of nationalities, a diversity of viewpoints, a diversity of situatedness, and that we do look at the intersections of what people bring. If we can look at those things, I think it brings to bear um, a lot more fruitful educational experience because you'll bring different research methods, you'll bring different research topics, different research methodologies, um, and even just um, different research questions. Um, for example, many times the traditional ways that some of us got taught in our disciplines, we talk about you know research subjects, you know, and so depending on who you are, no, these aren't research subjects. This is someone's son. This is someone's daughter. This is a human being. Um, one of the things I learned um, that I know Anita and um, Lata are also painfully familiar with or joyfully familiar with is um, appreciative inquiry. And when I was first exposed to that methodology, I just railed against it. So I was like, oh, this is just painting everything with sunshine. And I'm interested in these nitty gritty topics and injustices and what's happening. And as I said, iron sharpens iron, getting out there and actually doing consulting and actually working in organizations. People are like flowers. Flowers don't bend away from darkness. Flowers bend toward the sun. And so toward that extent, I have found appreciative inquiry to be an extremely valuable tool in helping people themselves to come to a vision of a realization of what gives them life and to come to a decision of what they want to see. And at that point, I find that doing this work becomes easier because they're able to have a voice in creating what needs to happen. And we're able to focus on the things that give energy and the things that move us forward. And so that um, explains a lot of the philosophy that I bring to um, doing this work. I think um, the COVID-19 crisis, um, except for the losses of life and losses of economic stability, I think it has been wonderful for higher education because from a change management perspective, it has unfrozen us. And so when you want to instill new things, higher education's shaken and it's unfrozen because I think to continue to be relevant, um, for some trade schools are far more relevant right now because we're sort of like this ivory tower and sitting and teaching people things. I think as we move forward to be successful, we really do need to look at our new student body and look at their new needs and look at the organizations and the communities that they're gonna be going into and really look at what they're going to be tasked with doing. And I think liberal arts schools have a wonderful place in this because they're teaching the why, but I think they have a challenge to say why, that why is um, more important. And so I'm excited to sit here um, on the panel and to learn from all my fellow panelists. So thank you. So everybody, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. I apologize for the enormous difficulties I've had in getting into the conversation, but I'm so thrilled to be in it. And the fact that we have obstacles and challenges and blocks is something that, uh, and, and a spirit to overcome, is something that I'm hearing, Jay, and what you're talking about. Uh, one of the things that um, is uh, critically important and that I'm hearing from all that what I've heard of what you all are saying is that in this moment, we've got a lot of challenges, perhaps unprecedented in their intensity and complexity with uh, social justice issues, with the ways in which systems are coming apart and having to reinvent themselves simply because of COVID. I saw a recent uh, uh, take and an article uh, written by a management professor who was arguing that this is a moment of opportunity as much as it is a moment of challenge. So in that spirit, I wanna continue to sort of hear what you all have to say, building out of your experiences about what do we need to do to really move people in the direction Jay, of engaging in those kinds of changes, um, of really beginning to themselves step up into that, past the point of simply performance-based kind of engagement, right? Um, 
Who else hasn't yet spoken or introduced? On my screen, I think I see Rick as the next person to uh, speak. I don't want to come across as a, as a disembodied voice, so I just uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to invite uh, Rick uh, Colborn to speak. Uh, welcome back, Rick. Rick has uh, participated in our series last year uh, with a wonderful paper. Uh, well, uh, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, everyone, uh, thanks for th sharing your stories. I think that's important. I'm coming to you from the, uh, the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin people here in Ottawa in Canada. I'm a member of the Mattawa North Bay Algonquin First Nation in Northern Ontario. You know, um, when I think about my narrative kind of, it starts um, with parents who never went to university, who never finished high school, uh, who have never had those opportunities. And uh, so uh, as, a, as somebody who was trying to kind of navigate their way through this, I didn't have guides. I didn't have, I didn't have a network. Um, and I think that that drives me in terms of how do we open up universities, how do we tear down these walls and how do we bring air into it so that we have a wider group of students who are coming in. And so, you know, part of my narrative is that I work with kids off the projects, right? So um, from like six years old up to 13, and then I did street work. So I worked with drug, alcohol and mental health on the downtown east side, which is uh, basically working with people who live on the street and um, that's their life. And so a lot, of, a lot of the work that I've done kind of comes out of that. Um, so when I went into education, what was, I was very much a critical scholar. I was very much a critical um, person. I looked at power. I looked at how power and learning kind of in, work together, not only in universities, but in organizations because I'm in a business school. And so for me, power is a, a very key component of the work that I do and thinking about how does power interact with what we do on an everyday level. You know, power for me is implicated in the buildings that we create and how people come into spaces, the spaces, whether they marginalize us or not, right? Um, are they open to, to marginalized and racialized communities? And not all spaces are, you know, some of them are shut down. Um, you know, a lot of the work that I've done is with Indigenous communities, so looking at colonization and reconciliation, you know, how do we start uh, re-legitimizing Indigenous ways of knowing and being, because in Canada and with Indigenous peoples worldwide, uh, Indigenous ways of knowing and being have been delegitimized, they've been marginalized, um, they put to the side, and in Canada now we're really trying to, to bring that to bear within our institutions. So what that meant was a lot of the work that I did, I had to be an activist in, in my institutions, which did not make me a very popular person, right? Because you're always that voice. You're always that person who's saying, what about these? What about this? Why are we doing this? Um, so uh, there are times when, for me, you know, again, if we're thinking about this as a narrative, it was very challenging. It was very hard. Um, but I was driven by the need to keep moving, to keep, to keep, working within these institutions. And in Canada, from an Indigenous perspective, it started to change about five years ago with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so from, that enabled me to move from being an activist within institutions to being an advocate. And then from being an advocate to coming into this role that I'm now as a, an Associate Dean of Equity and Inclusive Communities. And so a lot, of that, a lot of the work that I'm doing comes out of that experience. It comes out of the work that I did on the street. It comes out of that, that uh, feel, feeling that, right? So, so the approach that I take to, to, to everything that I do is around empathy and community. So when I'm thinking about what I'm doing, I'm thinking about empathy and I'm thinking about community. When I teach business, I teach about empathy and community, that we are parts of communities and that we can't be extractive, right? That we need to be giving back to communities and any work that we do needs to be mutually beneficial. You know, how are we impacting the work, the communities that we're doing? And so that translates internally to thinking about how do we open up our recruitment so that we're not just bringing in the same old students? How do we open that up and how do we provide financial support for students who may not have that? How do we rethink our curriculum, right? And our pedagogy? 
But not only that, how do we make sure our faculty are in line with that? Because they're not always in line. You know, for some faculty, social justice is, is a dirty word. And that's amazing to me because social justice for me is a fundamental. But I know that there are faculty there who see this as a dirty word, as a construct. They see that this idea of marginalization or equity as a construct. They don't see that this is the reality and the lived experience of our students and some of our faculty and members of the community. And that's part of the work that, that, that I kind of need to, to do when I'm, when I'm navigating through this. So uh, when we, we think about recruitment, how do we open up recruitment to kind of echo Renee's words? How do we rethink tenure, and pro tenure promotion? How do we rethink what, what publications count? Because it, again, you know, the publications, if I want to have impact, real impact are not always journal publications. They're practitioner, they're community. Um, from a research perspective, not all my research is going to be publishable because the research, for example, may be very much active-based research where we're going into communities and we're enabling a community to challenge neoliberal forces within that urban community to enable them to push against that. But that's not what academics, or particularly in business schools, do. So how, how do we keep that moving? Well, part of that is to attract other faculty who share those values and beliefs. And what I'm really excited about is at, at the Sprott School of Business, we're turning this around. And we've got a new dean who, who this is a fundamental value. And so we're very much really digging into all of those pieces to make that change. But that's slow. It's hard work. Um, and it means, you know, you're rethinking how you hire, you're rethinking how you look at, you know, applications, because in a university, you don't always see all the applications. They're screened before you, they come to you. So how do we start to see more so that we can look at that diversity? Um, from a research perspective, I'm working with indigenous communities. I'm working with LGBTQ2S plus communities. Um, I'm thinking about how do we make a difference in that? And then how does that feed back into the institution? So how do we create programs for indigenous, black, LGBTQS2 communities that are con connected to the community, but we can drive that out, out of the university and leverage our resources. So that means I'm also talking to fundraisers, right? Like funders, how do we bring the money in to be able to support that? So it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and, uh, but I do it because I think universities have been elitist and universities have been shut down. To, to marginalize, racialized communities. And I think we need those voices within our institutions to make change. And if it's a small change, a small change counts, right? But every day when we make change, we start to push those walls, we open those windows. And for me, that, that's what drives me, is every time we have a new indigenous student, a new black student, a new LGBTQ2S plus program, that means we're getting there. And, but it's a, it's, a, it's a project and it's a long-term project. And, and uh, it's tied up in pedagogy, it's tied up in curriculum, it's tied up in how we look at our research, how we partner on our research, you know, transdisciplinary research and multidisciplinary research, and then how we tie that into the community and how that benefits the community. Um, and so that's kind of my, my approach and, and the, the kind of things that I think about. And so another side of the work that I do is I build partnerships, I build alliances with community organizations, with, with other, with potential corporations, if they wanna be part of the kind of work that we're doing in an authentic way. If they're inauthentic about that, then we, we, don't, we won't partner with them. And then with other institutions and other partners uh, and other faculty members. And so we're very open around uh, partnering. We're very open around that so that we can achieve those, those gains and achieve that vision that we're after. So, that's just, uh, you know, hit into it, kind of where I come from. So thank you. Thank you for that powerful schema for change and for a real paradigm shift that is profound and steady state in how you engage and move that with a real intention to make that impact and that shift happen. Not just re-envisioning, but actually moving it uh, with that kind of uh, really gritty, focused intention and clarity. Um, can we hear from Melanie Hart now? Um, because I know you're in a role where you're seeing that from the standpoint of the whole system change that we just heard about being moved in a very steady state fashion. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so pleasure to be here. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I am very excited that 
uh, Provost White is now at my institution, so I am very excited today hearing from her. Um, but, you know, in order to tell my story, uh, my narrative, my story is very much so grounded in a Black feminist theory, but it's very much so Black feminist practice because it's grounded in my mother. My mother was a Black woman um, from the South, from Alabama, uh, born in 1939, which means she picked cotton in this country, right? And so there's nothing that I do that grounds me more than that experience of being the daughter of a, of a Black woman who picked cotton in this country and then migrated north, very specifically to New York City in search of freedom, literally. And so my work, my practice, my practice, my research is always grounded in the idea of liberation. And that is where I place this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice within the idea of liberation. And how do we achieve that? How do we define that? And how do we think about that? And so I, I come to this work very authentically as an individual, as a Black woman. Um, and then I bring the academic practice around it. And so very much so a practitioner before anything else, Black woman and then a community organizer. And so that's very much how I've approached this work even within institutions. And so I'm a lawyer by training, but I've also worked in many different disciplines. So I have run workforce development systems for the city of New York. I've run housing for the city of New York. New York City Housing Authority have been executive in that organization. What I've done throughout my entire career is look at the systems that we have needed to impact in order to have systemic transformation, in order to achieve liberation. And so I've tried to work throughout those different systems and think about real transformation and change and liberation within those contexts. And so higher education is a natural place for me because that is where, for lack of a better word, is the training ground for many of our future leaders. And so when I think about the work that I have done, I have always said, how do I make sure that we're building on each other and that we're making sure that this move, work continues to move forward and is not dependent on any individual. And so me coming into higher education very much so has been about, and now how do we think about the, remain, the next generations um, and what their work will be and how they engage with and participate in those systems, whether they're leading them, uh, whether they're recipients of them, my master's degree is in urban policy from the new school. And so I'm returning to my academic home in many ways. And I think about policy in the context of both being a recipient of that policy and being on the side of receiving. So being those, being someone who's actually executed, implemented and changed those policies and thinking about that real world impact of what that means for individuals who are moving through these systems that operate in higher education, that operate in housing, that operate in workforce that operate in all areas of our lives and intersect through individuals. And so I take a very systemic approach to thinking about uh, equity, inclusion, and social justice. At the new school, <laughs> President McBride had the honor of starting right in the middle of, right as COVID hit. Um, and he also started uh, in March of 2020 and in May of 2020 is when George Floyd was murdered on camera. It was not a new event in the world. It was another individual that we lost and yet it spurred many people to action and spurred institutions to action. Um, and so one of the things that we did at the institution was we actually launched the Office of Equity, Inclusion and Social Justice. So that is when I stepped into the role of Senior Vice President for Equity, Inclusion and Social Justice and the Chief Diversity Officer role. And I say and because they're not the same role, right? Necessarily because you're doing Chief Diversity Officer work is not necessarily the same work as saying, and what would we do if we had diversity and equity inclusion, would you actually still, would you achieve social justice and recognizing the differences that can exist in that space. And so these two roles I hold right now, I also hold the role of we're leading and building on our government and external affairs, because as we think about what's the work that we're doing internally, we must also have an eye on how this work is being impacted from the external community and how we're impacting the community outside the academic institution similar to what Renee talked about, this idea about who are the actual academics versus the intellectuals and where's the production of knowledge coming from when we think about how do we move our systems forward. This racial reckoning, if we wanna call it that, is not a new phenomenon. And in fact, I would argue that many of the things that we're seeing today are just a repeat of what we've seen historically, right? In different times, it looked different ways, right? And so this is not new. The seas of the capital is not new. None of these events that we're seeing are new, and yet it is incumbent upon those of us who are entrenched in this work to think about new and innovative ways to, to respond. 
and to be proactive and to think about what are the systems and structures that we need so that we can actually disrupt it. And so while COVID has given us an opportunity to disrupt, while Black Lives Matter movement has given us an opportunity to, to disrupt, the reality is that we, I, I come from this thinking about it from a systemic level and seeing the cycles of it, right? The highs and lows, the cycles that we continue to repeat. And so how do we start to break that? Um, I also ground my work because I am an attorney also in the idea of, and this is you know, the most overwrought term today of critical race theory, <laughs> but actually being someone who went to law school, that's where we learn the phrase, right? That's where we learn the pedagogy of it. And so very much using that in terms of how we center the narrative of those who are being impacted, right? When we think about the, the, the dynamics of power and privilege, this question of how do we shift power? How do we shift privilege? So when I talk about inclusion, it is very much so saying not just bringing different people to the table and providing access, but those who are sitting around are defining whether or not that is actually a table, right? We need to disrupt this entire conversation of what it means to have inclusion and what that looks like and who's defining it, because it's coming from a perspective of those who have been excluded and now we're thinking about inclusion. And once people get to the table, it might look like a totally different thing if different people can actually come in and actually work on that. So at the new school one, I'm working particularly around four areas being the student experience, uh, pedagogy and curriculum, faculty and staff, recruitment, retention, and development, and then very much so this idea of leadership accountability. There's a distributive model of how we do this work, right? No one, not all of us know you cannot have an office sitting to the side where everyone comes to and says, that's where you send all your issues, right? And so this idea, very much so grounded in me being a community organizer works very well for me is thinking about how do you make sure you're lifting up and imbuing the community so that they find their own power sources, right? This is not about me empowering people, people come with their own power and yet we also have to have support and accountability. And so how do we do that through our entire community so that we can say systemic change is coming not from the top down, not from the bottom, but we're all meeting in the middle. And this is a more systemic change perspective of how you move the institution. So I'll stop there and look forward to my colleague, Crystal. It's a, a very insightful extension of the conversation where you are really uh, coming from that whole uh, investment that others have talked about and also building out from their comments around power and structure and the fact that moving out of these comfort levels of the current structures is going to be disruptive, right? And it's gonna require us to really engage in very um, different ways perhaps to continue the, the actual implementation of the kind of changes we often are talking about but aren't walking the, the talk with. Um, can we hear now from Crystal? Well, first I, I wanna just, um, thank all of my colleagues for their very thoughtful reflections about how they came into this space, why they are in the space, what do they think about when they're undertaking their work, which is varied and um, deeply ambitious. So I appreciate all that you have said. I think I'm gonna keep my comments short because generally I'm, I build on you know things that everybody has said. What I will say that is distinctive perhaps is that I come to the work, um, I was raised in a biracial or a multiracial home. My mother was white, my father black uh, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, so for me, race and class have always been central issues um, and have caused me to, over the course of my life, ask relatively complex questions uh, and look at the paradoxes uh, that we exhibit as humans um, on an ongoing basis. And I, my field is poetry, I am a poet. So I am by nature and training someone who thinks really deeply about how strange human beings are uh, and how jacked up we can be, you know, just. <laughs> um, and I say that uh, sort of jokingly, but not to say that the, the way in which I approach the work of change management and organizational change is really through that lens. That is to say that I think that we are all of us, each of the individuals of us, our organizations, the units within the organizations, the departments, the schools and colleges, all of that, um, all, of the, all of that is exists in a developmental framework, 
right? That we are all developing in one way or another. The poet in me approaches the individuals um, essentially with love in my heart, right? Like I, I understand because I understand sort of how torqued I, my stuff is because I grew up in the United States of America, right? <laughs> um, that you probably have some of that too. Uh, and so, um, and so I think that's an important framing. It has allowed me to create, I've, this is the third inaugural diversity role I've created. It means that I come into the organization and really look to see where the organization is developmentally on the spectrum. Cause not every org, right? Every organization is distinctive um, and you cannot superimpose diversity work that can happen at the new school on diversity work that can happen at NYU on diversity work that can happen at BU. There are commonalities across, but the institutions are fundamentally different and the cultures are different and where you are in the developmental spectrum, right, varies widely. So one of the things I think about all the time is, well, University of Michigan has been at this for 35 years. BU has been at this for four years. If I'm going to expect BU to be able to do exactly what Michigan is going to do, I'm going to run up against some real difficulties, and that's going to cause me more friction than I need to have caused. Undergirding that way of thinking, I think, is, a, is also a very deep belief that's rooted in history. And what I know of history tells us that this work is iterative, and right? Um, Provost White actually talked about this. This is not new. We are on, we've been given the, the baton, now we're running and we'll hand it off to someone else, right? So I think that it's iterative, it's developmental, it is unique and individual, and it calls us to bring our most creative selves to the fore. That's essentially how I approach the work. I would also say, I think those of us who are in this work do ourselves and the work itself and our students and our faculty and those people who are really engaged with us. I think we do a disservice when we don't acknowledge how abstract uh, our goals are for most people. Most people in my experience have never actually experienced a truly diverse environment. <laughs> they don't know. If I ask my faculty and I've done this multiple times so I'm not, you know, uh, telling any secrets. How many of you as either a student or a faculty member have been in a truly diverse environment? Now here I'm talking about my faculty colleagues, not my students because they're living in a different world, but my faculty colleagues. Very few hands go up. So if I know that, and if that's a fact, for me to ask faculty to engage with me, to roll up their sleeves with me, I actually also need to honor the fact that I'm asking them to step out on a wing and with some faith in a vision that they have not actually experienced. And that's a hard thing to do. And if I don't acknowledge that, then I'm asking them to participate in an abstraction and I'm not actually giving them the tools that they need in order to do that. So, you know, um, those are some of the, th the ways I think about this work. Um, and I think the other things that are sort of undergirding the, the, the way I am in the work or the reasons I'm in the work have to do with the fact of my family, um, the fact that I truly believe that our diversity, and here I mean broad diversity is a source of mutual power and effectiveness. I think our brilliance, our collective brilliance, there's too much of it that's left on the table, that is not ignited, that is um, in fact the opposite of ignited, right? It's um, a, a wet blanket has been put over it. Uh, I think that we are a less powerful society because of that, right? Because of our, um, our, our, so th that's what drives me in the work. I think, I, I don't know if I guess I would say a couple other things. Um, at BU, uh, and these strategies are different. They're, they're different than the strategies that I used at Bates and they're different than the strategies I used at Reed and that's because each of those institutions were very different from one another. Um, 
at BU, the, the sort of five guiding strategies for BU d so BU diversity and inclusion are to set the foundation and shift the culture, so that's one. We're focused on building capacity across the institution and that's capacity with individuals, with units, with schools and colleges and institutional capacity. We're focused on connecting people and fostering communities, right, that really, um, uh, amplify um, the power in our differences on behalf of the common endeavor. We're focused on uh, offering transparent information and data. Uh, and sometimes that actually means creating data that has not existed, creating systems, right? So there are, sy there are systems work in all of what I'm saying to you, but the, these are just the broad strategies. And then the final is to recruit, retain, and then to promote thriving. Um, and of course, um, you know, we can talk more explicitly about any of those, but those are the those are the the strategies. And I came across those strategies after running essentially about a seven month listening tour, right? Big groups of people, individuals assessing. So to use Provost Morris, I mean Provost uh, White's um, language, auditing, <laughs> right? What actually is going on? Where are we? And my assessment was that. We needed to, at an institution of 43,000 people, build institutional capacity. I needed many, many more people to have the capacity to trigger change at the unit level in order for us to do anything that was grand and institutional. If not, it would be like just sort of dropping a penny here and a penny there. So I'll stop because I realize it's, it's, it's a little after one and we don't have that much time. And I think that there are probably Anita has an agenda and there are probably questions. Well, I just want to thank you of uh, the lens of the poet and that very poetically and moving understanding of the humanness of this effort, right? And it's not a plug-in kind of thing. The fact that we having to reinvent and recreate on the regular and always from who we really are uh, collectively and individually is a powerful understanding. Um, and I really appreciate that personally. Um, we have, um, and, and I wanna encourage comments to be added to the chat and questions. Um, one that is in the chat now, I think really builds off of and, and encourages uh, you to come back all, all of you uh, with, uh, here's the question, can, this, can the speakers share some concrete examples or you know, models of how to structurally and systems wide go beyond representation in education. Um, some successful attempts uh, and some failed attempts and what we can learn from them. This move from, uh, as the title of this uh, talk is about moving from the, uh, the inclusion, you know, to the equity all the way through to the justice. Social justice is about actually doing something about things we're aware of, right? And so this, this um, question is really, can you talk about some concrete examples of, or models of how this has been done in your experience? And um, also some of the failed attempts and what they tell us that we need to learn from. Um, well, I, I, I don't know if this is, I, I think I heard that it's likely the case that all of us in some way or another are addressing um, the diversification of the faculty. And, you know, I, one of the things I would say is sans real um, holistic change around faculty hiring. What we do essentially is work around the edges of an existing system that is relatively exclusionary. So I just wanna put that on, <laughs> on the table. Um, and I'd also say uh, that the academy broadly in my experience is, is perhaps one of the most hierarchical, elitist and exclusive uh, kinds of organizations or kinds of, right, th th that exist that exists um, because the entire thing is predicated upon exclusion um, and elitism, 
you know, maybe with the exception of community colleges. Uh, so everything about faculty autonomy, faculty hiring is really based on hierarchy, individualism, uh, the merit, like meritocracy, that whole myth, all of that. I would say that um, there are real successes in faculty hiring, but in order to get to them concretely, you've got to change the ways that faculty understand or, or, and or um, define excellence, which is a real pressure point in the academy. Um, you, you, so you've got to change bias. You've got to change the faculty hiring structure. You've got to change promotion and tenure on the, on the tail end. You've got to actually um, change the way and or the amount of faculty lines that are allocated because there are you know, cohort hiring, we know works. So we, we know what works in faculty hiring. The problem is we don't do it because it's very costly and it's costly both financially and it's also costly in terms of human. So one of the things that um, I would say does not work or I, I have seen fail and has failed on, on, on my side, what has worked and what hasn't both, with both on the same side. When I go in to work with a faculty, with a group of faculty around their hiring culture and really begin to ask them to interrogate the assumptions and the biases that exist uh, that simply sort of um, repeat the same kinds of mistakes that we've seen over the course of the last 150 years. Um, if I hold that group of people close and talk with them through their process, right? and create a space that allows for them to be really in communication with me because that's a kind of coaching and mentoring. That has been, it can be relatively successful. When I come in and just give them a training or come in and just talk to them and then send them off into the world, <laughs> right? they do what everybody does. They revert to the habitual state. And this to me is a great metaphor for the work that we all have undertaken, which is to say, we all humans revert to the habitual state <laughs> unless there is something else holding us in a, a space of newness. So that's one concrete example. I, I don't know if that's a helpful example, but at least it's on my side, it's a concrete example. I want to jump. Oh yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, Provost, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that, you know, um, I that really resonates with me because I think another um, um, challenge that we face is that when we know the, the language, right? We know how to talk the talk, which becomes a kind of deflector to the actual work that needs to be done behind it. And sometimes we mistake that for people being really understanding all the various steps that need to be taken to do the work. And so I think like you were saying, Crystal, that, you know, needing to sort of, you know, have a stepwise process throughout, you know, whether it is about from, you know, recruitment to um, hiring and then the retention strategy for folks, it has to be all of that, you know, and I um, had a conversation at my uh, previous institution with a colleague who was, um, you know, doing all the important things and thinking about, you know, we want to have a, a, a pool of candidates that's, you know, diverse in multiple ways, you know, but I, I, all I know are people like me. And so I said, so, you know, um, have, you, have you networked with, you know, uh, HSIs? How are you networked with HBCUs? Just as a start, like that's just like basic kind of thing. And the fact that that hadn't occurred to her made me realize, oh, okay, so even with the tools, you're still coming from a particular vantage point that you may not even realize is kind of constraining already and limiting sort of what you see as sort of basic sort of fundamental strategies that you can engage in. Um, and then the other thing is just in terms of um, thinking about the, the ways that this work can be successful. Um, and I've seen it both at my previous institution, which is a liberal arts college, as well as uh, I see it at the new school is the absolute importance and the imperative of the leadership articulating 
very clearly and very concretely what they're about beyond I embrace this, but they have to really put their political and social capital at stake to say explicitly, this is what I mean by what I want us to do. Because once you do that, you kind of open the door to the people who have to actually implement the work. But if it's too theoretical or too conceptual and not grounded in, this is how it translates into our plan, or this is how it translates into our strategic you know, thinking or our mission, then it, it, it's too fuzzy and the, the charge is unclear. Um, and it's hard to kind of, you know, feel that you are tasked with actually carrying out the things. So at my previous institution, what that meant was, you know, I worked very closely with the president around saying that, uh, and that was at Wheaton College in Massachusetts, that the campus was going to move toward uh, committing to anti-racist practice. And we were very intentional in saying, you know, um, we are not there yet. We're committing to the work, which recognizes that there's a lot of gap, a lot of space between saying the thing and doing it. And then move to create a structure that really charged every single office in every area to have representation around this work. And then that allowed those groups to then move forward, right? So I think that it's a couple of pieces here. It's being very, very clear, very concrete in what you're actually saying you're gonna do. And then creating a structure that actually allows people to do the work. Because I think a lot of times we hear criticisms about, for example, chief diversity officers are a dime a dozen, or this is a whole scam. And it's because that's in bad faith. So some of that is bad faith you know, at play, but it's also because when you create a, a, a position, but you don't think about the structure needed and what the charge is and how you're gonna articulate your expectations, you leave someone to, found, to founder and to fail. Um, so I'm always trying to think about the way we talk about it to what we have to build as a structure that enables the, the work to move forward. Um, you know, so that was not so much of a, of a really sort of specific way to enact it, but I think more rather a call to the ways that we need to make sure that we're not setting up our institutions to fail at this work. And then this one last thing I think is, this is about the, about academia as a whole. So if we have like a couple of places where people are doing this work, there are a couple of risks to that because if the entirety of academia doesn't recognize the import of what we're doing, it remains really localized. So the next question is, how do we take what we see as being really important and take it into our professional organizations and take it into you know, our field? And how are we partnering across institutions to create some structures that allow us to really have to collectively move some of this forward so it's actually lasting? Yes, Rick. Uh, sorry, Jane, were you, you, did you want to say something? First? Yes, I was, yes, I was going to um, say a couple of things. First, I was going to say something that I think works has to do with the, um, the compatibility between the way that you're doing the work or the level at which you're doing the work and your institution's values and mission. Um, one of the things that um, is great about the situation I'm currently in at Pepperdine is that uh, part of our mission is dealing with the person and the human being is at the center of the educational endeavor. And so that frees me to work at my level of specialty, which is not systemic, but it's micro, but it's supporting of systemic because um, like um, Crystal said, the fact that you can give people tools and they don't know what to do with them, they don't know what to use them, there's a lot of development that's needed. So we're focusing on some foundational capabilities that we want all of our community members to have, dialogue and ability to see how unity exists in a system. Um, the fact of looking at another person ahead of yourself, being agile, having imagination, being mindful and focusing on egalitarian service. And then from that, building on top of that, the capacity to use some of the tools and the knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, some things that I have seen work as far as diversifying the faculty, especially in business, is KPMG's PhD project, of which I was a part as a doctoral student, and which I'm now a part as a factory faculty mentor. And essentially what it was, it wasn't funding um, um, 
students through their doctoral program, but what it was, it mentored us. So for Hispanic, Black, and um, Indigenous students in business disciplines, what they did, they had their own um, conference that was everything from first year, how to read a journal article, how to write a proposal, how to manage and choose your dissertation chair, to how to go on the job market, how to interview. And then they also um, adhered that to the professional conference, which for my field was Academy of Management. And they paid our way to that conference and lodged us there. And they told us how to read the program, had the president of the Academy of Management come in and talk with us and socialized us into our field. And that served as a social network. And so we are humans, we are people. And so we're, we're social beings. So with the social and also the tactical, um, that was extremely um, effective. Many of us are doing what we, um, um, we're, we're kind of built to do. Another thing that I've seen work as far as hiring a faculty, we say we want faculty to be collegial and we want them to value diversity. But like you say, we have these individualistic elitist hiring practices. Um, I've seen um, a university actually experienced it at um, California State University Channel Islands. The way they hired was in groups. And I don't mean groups in the same discipline. They brought in a person from biology, from business, from English, sociology, physiology, everything, and they'd bring in maybe 30 people. And what they do, they'd have a social and a mixer. They would have small groups and have the candidates work together on a group task. They would observe how people worked in groups. They did a traditional interview. They did the traditional job talk, but they really were a collegial institution and uh, multidisciplinarity was part of their cultural value. So they mimic that in their interview process and they got people that were team players and when you look at the structures and how people were seated they scrambled up the departments they didn't just sit all the biology people here they didn't just sit all the anthropologists there so from sort of soup to nuts that particular um, interdisciplinary value that they had they carried it all the way through so to that extent if we do value diversity, if we do value inclusion, we need to think of those things from the standpoint of recruiting of faculty from admissions. There needs to be something in the admissions process for students that tags to see that they have, um, they value diverse environments. They're you know, going to create inclusion in our hiring and our reward structures. It's not rewarded, for example, with underrepresented faculty members. The service that they are often called upon from the inside and from the outside to do with underrepresented students often goes unrewarded when it's time to go up for evaluation because service is serving on the curriculum committee, service is serving on the tenure committee. And so we need to fundamentally look differently at how those things are. And when those things count, um, those things go well. Things I've seen fail are when Organizations are focused quite a bit on diversifying on the hiring end, but they have a revolving door of people leaving because they're not focusing on the retention. And so those are some things that I've seen um, work and things that I've seen fail. Can we hear from Rick and then uh, Melanie and then we'll close with Latas uh, closing thoughts. So, you know, I think that uh, we can't have diverse faculty if our students don't make it through primary school. If our students don't make it through public school, through high school, you know, I can speak from an indigenous experience is that we've had to go back to public school. We've had to go to high schools to say, to make sure our students aren't quitting, right? That they're not leaving. And then we need to get them into the universities and create pathways, right? And create lots of different pathways through strategies around broad-based uh, recruitment, through creating the, the financial supports and potentially the, 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 the community supports that they need to leave their communities and to be successful in the university. And then we need to help them kind of create those pathways through the graduate school and, and have those TARA opportunities so that then they can go and do their PhD. So for me, what's really important is we need to kind of go back and make sure that path is clear and make sure that we're building success and, and we're supporting that. And that's something that we did with a program called the Chinook program out on the West Coast when I was with UBC in the Sauter School of Business because it was very clear to us that a lot of students weren't even getting to university. Um, a lot of students when they were accepted were scared. They couldn't even cross the threshold of a university. And so we worked with, uh, with uh, primary school students and high school students to just start getting them used to that idea to, 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 to allow them to understand that they can be part of this, that they aren't 
that they are able to do this, right? Uh, because a lot, of, a lot of indigenous students have been told no, they distrust education, um, that uh, they're, they're not good enough. And, and so we did a lot of work around, around working on that. And so that eventually can bring these students up and, and, and create these PhDs or become our future faculty. And so I would, I would just add, you know, we're working on so many of these things. I think Crystal raised a great point about where you are in your institutional growth, right? And where you are in your organization and what your expectations are. And I think, you know, we sit in a unique position at the New School because we're a very progressive institution and yet we still need to build frameworks, right? We still need to build the infrastructure to be able to do these things. And part of it is having a common language and understanding of what it is we're even talking about, quite frankly, when we talk about inclusion and social justice, what does that actually mean? And we, we, I think someone mentioned earlier this idea of what does it mean when you have such a large international community and what is it rooted in, right? I think lots had raised the point of when it's an international community also coming in, we're not just talking about a domestic context. And so I think that the, the complexity of that requires that we have um, really a, a really complicated idea of what diversity, inc equity, inclusion mean, not to the extent that we're doing the diversity of thought as the exclusion, as the exclusive purview of this is what we now have as diversity. This, there are people who are systemically excluded from these institutions that we know we need to address, right, within the context of social justice. To, to the question that was raised, you know, we have an, I think my, I have an example that's very tangible that happened in the institution that I think is both a success and a failure. And it speaks to what a Provost White spoke to of being able to audit. So I think all of us probably have done a campus climate assessment at this point, at least once in our careers. And we've done that. And so we have these, this baseline. But one of the things that we did also very early on in the development of the office was put out a call to action to the entire community. And we did it at every level for people who had any responsibility for any function in the institution. And the idea was to say, what can you do in a very short term as we think about these very systemic and long-term things that take incremental change? What can you do from your position of power that will influence and impact how we are doing from an equity, diversity, and inclusion perspective and social justice perspective? Literally freeing up everyone to step into that position and say, this is what I could do today to change the experience of the people that I impact. And we did it saying no new resources and not dependent on anyone else. What can you do in your purview, right? And so it was an opportunity. And I think the, 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 the failing of it, and it was, for me, it was a learning and not in a, in a very, you know, it's data. It gives you data. It taught us that people have to learn and understand what it means. What are we talking about when we say equity, inclusion, and social justice? Right? That is not a common language. It is not something that everyone understands in the same way. And so that is one of those things that we actually have to say, oh, give people the tools, the resources, and a common understanding of what this means to move this forward, right? Because it will, it will look different in different ways. The success of it was seeing people at all levels of an organization activate and really recognize their basis of power and how they were impacting and influencing culture, policy, and practice. I think that's a tremendous success for people sitting at different parts of the institution. It also gave us an opportunity to understand where are the people across the institution? How do you diagnose that? And now how do you galvanize that, right? And so where are you starting? So I do think that there's success and failure in all of our learning. And so I think that that's one of those tangible examples. Powerful sharings. I just want to personally thank all of you for your stories, for your insights, for your experience, and for your steadfast work in the arena of not just the academy, uh, research, education, but moving social change, moving equitable social change, and moving uh, social action. Uh, making that a common language and engaging it is something that uh, it's truly a mission and a calling, and I thank you for it. Lata. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anita, particularly, and thanks all the panelists for joining us. And obviously, we can hold probably like a three-day conference on this just with you all, not even inviting anybody else, and we will still be scratching the surface of what we can do in academic institutions because I think academic institutions I always find like you know like it's, it's a paradox right because uh, one of the things that academic institutions get valued is the legacy 
that, oh, you've been around for 100 years, you've been around for 300 years, or you've been around for 400 years. That means like you are an uh, institution that's enduring. And there is a cost to that enduring nature of institutions, which is that structures get reified, power differentials get uh, reinforced, and traditions get established. And that makes it very difficult to uh, break into. So this was a really energizing conversation. Thank you so much everybody for joining us and uh, our uh, you know as we said this is the first event of the series for this year and the second one uh, is going to be on September 22nd and this year I'm also kind of like opening it up a little bit uh, that you know I don't want to hold this for just for the new school so we are actually starting to host co co-hosted events so September, September 22nd which is Wednesday now at 11 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. Uh, p.m. Eastern, we're going to co-host this event with Bristol University uh, in the UK. And uh, uh, you know, we've been working with them for a couple of years now on different things. And one of the things that uh, the focus is going to be on transdisciplinary and technology approaches to diversity, inclusion, and equity and justice. And what does it mean? Like, when does it help? When does it not help? We all know all the, you know, algorithmic biases and, uh, you know, does technology provide access? Does technology actually uh, mediate access? Does technology exclude uh, people because if they don't have access? So we're going to be looking at that. And, and then, so just to remind you of the cadence, we do first Thursdays, this Thursday is the second Thursday because of Labor Day, but it's usually first Thursdays and third Wednesdays, sign up and show up. And I am like really fortunate. I am absolutely deeply grateful for this opportunity for me to actually just hold the space. I think it's a gift uh, in a very selfish way just to myself uh, because it is such a reassuring uh, and reaffirming thing for me uh, in terms of like, you know, people talked about like for me personally, as a first generation college graduate uh, growing up in a, uh, in a not well to do uh, country uh, and a society which is very patriarchal, education is my salvation. It really did change my life. And so this particular panel is particularly like absolutely important for me. And I appreciate all of you showing up and thank you very much. And I hope to see you all in the next event. And we also have a book coming. Uh, or at least like the, we have just collected the chapter proposals. It's going to be an edited volume on managing for social justice. So we'll keep you posted. And uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day.